Reverend Barr, thank you for joining us here on New Mexico in Focus. We appreciate you joining us today. Thank you so much for having me here. Sure. You are involved in the Poor People's Campaign. This is a, um, influenced by Dr. King's last efforts in 1968. But you're doing a little differently, um, doing a sustainable um, campaign to tackle poverty. Why is this campaign important for places like New Mexico and Mississippi, some of the poorest states in the union? Well, first of all, um, Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, does in fact borrow from some of the legacy of Dr. King, the work that he and Cesar Chavez and Jewish Federation and um, uh, the welfare rights women were doing uh, when he decided, and was very clear that there were three interlocking evils, poverty, racism, and, and militarism that America had to deal with. And as he said, if she didn't, uh, America may very well go to hell. That was his last sermon that he was gonna preach before he was assassinated. Uh, we also borrow from the second reconstruction movement right after slavery, when black and white people came together, poor whites mainly, and blacks to say we had, they had to turn around the country by changing the reality in the South. Today, um, the Poor People's Campaign, that's the call for moral revival, is of, 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 is of grave importance. Um, when you look at, you just said New Mexico and Mississippi, and you look at those poverty numbers uh, and how high and how equally high they are, even though one is New Mexico and another one is Mississippi. Um, when you look at the reality uh, we have before COVID, 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country, 43% of the nation, 38 million children, 66 million white people, 26 million black people, 61% of the black people are poor and low wealth. That's what that 26 million represents. Then on top of that are 62 million people uh, who get up every morning and buy unleaded gas, can't buy unleaded water. And then you look at the reality that we have had before COVID 87 million people uninsured or uninsured. Now, after COVID, we're talking about 30 million people who are uh, unemployed. We're headed toward post 50%, plus 50% of the population being in poverty or low wealth, low income. We're talking about another 27 million people added to the 87 million people uninsured or underinsured who have lost their insurance because they lost their jobs. We're headed toward a great destruction, not a great depression. And we cannot merely go back to where we were before COVID. That, that is not good language because before COVID, we had 700 people dying a day from poverty and low wealth. Now we have another thousand dying from COVID. Poverty is a central issue. It is an issue that crosses the lines of race and color and sexuality. It is an issue that this um, nation must face. It is an issue until we face it, we're gonna have these ebbs and flows in our economic uh, reality. It is an issue because no matter how good Wall Street is doing among the one in top 1% and 10%, it has absolutely nothing to do with where poor and low wealth people are in this country. And I believe that if we don't address and we believe systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, a war economy, uh, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism, that we are actually undermining the very future of this democracy. One of the things that you um, tried to do as part of the Poor People's Campaign and uh, your groups is to bring the issue of poverty into the discussion of the 2020 election. Here in New Mexico, we have a Senate race and a very competitive race, a congressional race in the South. Why is it that you believe poverty should be on the agenda during these elections? My question is, how can it not be? That's what we have said to, um, that's what we have said to candidates that are here. How in the world can you choose not to uh, address an issue that's affecting almost 43% of the nation? When you look at the numbers, it's in the, you know, the millions of people that are poor and low wealth just in Mississippi and in New Mexico. I mean, how, how can you not address an issue where, for instance, if you just pay people a living wage, $15 an hour, you could uh, bring 49 million people out of poverty and put $368 million, $338 million, a billion dollars into the economy. 
Now, we always talk about tax cuts as the way to do it. We know that's voodoo economics, give to the top and never trickles down. But you know that if you pay a living wages, that money is going to go into the economy and it's going to build people up and it's going to help the whole economy. It is actually uh, constitutionally inconsistent, morally indefensible, and economically insane not to address the issue of poverty and low wealth. Uh, no nation can ignore a reality that's impacting 43% of its people. And I just want to keep driving that home. When you look at the supplemental rate and look at poverty, not the, just the old way of doing it, this 55 years old measurement that basically says, if you make $12,000 a year, you're not poor. Well, we know that's not true. Uh, <laughs> but if you look at the supplemental rate, you come away with 140 million people. For too long, for 50 years now, we have driven the issue of poverty out of the public debates. Uh, we have either, as Republicans, have racialized poverty, or we have seen where Democrats have run from poverty. They talk about it, but they talk about it so metaphorically. You know, they talk about things like people trying to get into the middle class. Well, some people are just trying to make it every day in the wealthiest society in this in the world. So I don't believe that anybody that's serious about leading this country can ignore the reality that what people were facing before COVID and that has only been exacerbated from COVID. COVID has actually ta taught us that poverty and racism are matters of national security. Imagine if, if in this country before COVID, people had made a living wage. They would have some disposable income. They could have stayed out of work. Imagine if people had had health care attached to their body and their humanity, not to their job. You know, but instead, we don't we didn't have those things. So the virus exploits racism and poverty. Then when we pass a CARES Act, 83 percent of all that money goes to corporations and banks. Now we turn around, have to pass another act that we can't get out of, uh, of the Senate. While 30 million people are out of unemployment, 30 something million people face eviction. You just, COVID is making us realize and has brought to the surface that not addressing poverty and racism is a matter of national security. One of the things that I always remember in, in catechism classes was the Gospel of Luke, you know, blessed are the poor, woe to the rich. You bring that as an issue it's to show like poverty is a can be a spiritual issue to be addressed. But even then, some religious leaders will point to another gospel to say, no, it's, you know, um, blessed are the poor in spirit. We can almost have two different conversations about poverty based on someone's political beliefs, set of facts. How can we have a better community discussion around poverty that eliminates people's differences and say, we need to address, here are the facts, people are struggling, let's have an honest discussion. How can we have a better community conversation around that? One of the things we have to do is first of all, just agree on some basic fundamental orthodox religiosity and Christianity, because it's been so distorted. And this didn't, didn't just start, you know, slave master religion distorted the gospel. The religion uh, that, that was developed by corporations with religionists to try to stop the New Deal has distorted the gospel. The moral majority distorted the gospel. White evangelicalism, what one of my professors called American Hannity distorted the gospel. Here's the gospel. There are more than 2,000 scriptures in the Bible that says nations will be judged basically by how they treat the poor, the stranger, the immigrant, and the least of these. Jesus opened his, his uh, uh, ministry by talking about, bless, uh, I've come to preach good news to the poor. And the word there for poor is patokos. It means those who've been made poor by economic injustice. That is just a fact. <laughs> It's indisputable. Jesus opens his ministry and begins his ministry. We're talking about the poor and the least of these. He says, uh, he says the nation will literally be judged by how it treats the least of these. So we have to at least come to terms with the fact that anyone who tries to talk it away, tries to say it shouldn't be a major moral issue from a religious standpoint, is just participating really in a modern day form of heresy. Uh, that, and you have to call it what it is. Secondly, uh, in our Constitution, we say that the first principle of that Constitution is the establishment of justice. And then we say something about promoting the general welfare. Well, you can't establish justice and promote the general welfare if you're not addressing an issue that's facing 140 million people, 43% of the country. So we have to, first of all, 
just d- decide that it is a form of democratic malpractice not to address the issue of poverty, both constitutionally and religiously and morally. Then secondly, we have to change the narrative by putting a face on the numbers. That's why the Poor People's Campaign travels to all of these communities, New Mexico, Alabama, and we put a face on the number so that people can't just dismiss it anymore as just numbers. We show the white farmers in Kansas struggling with poverty, just like black fast food workers in North Carolina. We show people in Alabama who are connecting now to people in Appalachia. And they are seeing how poverty and these other interlocking justices are impacting them. So you got to put a face on it. Then last, then next you have to destroy the mythology that we don't have the money. We don't have the money. Well, COVID is how to help do that because we found all these trillions of dollars suddenly for corporations. So nobody can say anymore that we don't have the money. We can't find the money. We found $3 trillion for corporations seeming like almost overnight. Uh, a, a trillion and a half went through the treasury. It didn't even come through the legislature. They said, we're going to make it happen. And then we have to build the power. We're going to, in order for this conversation to push, poor people have to show their power, which is why we're organizing and registering poor people to vote because they now represent 25% of the electorate. What would you like to see both President Donald Trump and Democratic nominee Joe Biden say during the debates to address poverty? If, if this is a perfect world, what kind of questions should the moderators be asking to bring the issue of poverty into this presidential campaign? Well, I wanted to pull this up. That's why I was just reaching for. One of the things I want them to acknowledge these numbers. So let's take, for instance, Mexico. They want votes in Mexico. 49% of the people in Mexico are poor and low income. That's a million people. 58% of all the children, 49% of women, 58% of people of color, 35% people that are white in New Mexico are poor and low wealth. In New Mexico, you've got 230,000 people that are uninsured. 2,000. So first of all, you, I want them to acknowledge the numbers and the people represented by the numbers. And then I want them to say how they will address these five interlocking injustices, systemic racism and all of its reality, police violence, yes, but also voter suppression, also continuing uh, 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 underfunding and resegregation of public schools and mass incarceration and the mistreatment of our immigrant brothers and sisters, Latino brothers and sisters, our mistreatment of indigenous brothers and sisters, but then also address poverty and the lack of living wages and ecological devastation. They have to address the issues, not talk around them, not just just um, uh, uh, you know come up with nice metaphors. We ought to be concerned. We want people to have you know, have the opportunity. What does that mean specifically? How will your campaign specifically? Now, we've actually invited them on September the 14th to become individuals, not a debate, to come before our um, uh, unleashing, voting is voting is power unleashed, Moral Monday, Poor People's Campaign is putting on, inviting thousands and thousands of thousands of people to, uh, of the three million people that joined us on June 20th for the Mass Poor People's Assembly to come back to be trained in voter protection and voter participation. And we've, had, we've invited Trump and Biden to come and each take seven minutes and talk to poor and low wealth people and say, listen, what is, well, here's, here's my agenda. This is how it's gonna impact all people, especially poor and low wealth people. Now, what else we're gonna do though, is we recognize that in any election, you have to make a choice, a practical choice. So poor and low wealth people are saying, we're gonna evaluate candidates. Then we're going to see who's closest to our agenda. We're going to vote for them. It's not about partisan. It's about practical voting. And then after the election, we're going to push them. You know, I wish that the media would decide that they're going to have one debate on nothing but poverty, on what's what's affecting 50% of this nation, and then and then have the questions come from poor and low wealth people, so it can't be something that folks skate around, and go to the heart of the matter. And they have to talk about that. What are you, where, where do you stand on living wages? Where do you stand on adequate safety nets? And I wish the media and others would not let people call it socialism because it is not socialism to make sure people have a living wage and make sure people have health care and make sure people have fundamental education. It's genuine democracy. 
It's not socialism. What is socialism is giving all this money to the corporations, <laughs> free money to corporations that just use that money and turn around and then just buy back their own stocks and do not produce jobs, and do not produce living wage jobs. That's a form of socialism. But there's no way you can, can say that socialism is uh, saying that a person that works a job will make a living wage. That's not socialism. That's something called right. It's just doing right. It's just doing justice. Dr. King once said, when you don't pay a man a living wage, you are actually, he called it, and, and called people to face murder, I mean, die, and die, that he called it murder. Coretta Scott King said it's violent when we don't pay people a living wage, when we do not pay people what they deserve. Jesus said, uh, woe unto those, uh, excuse me, the prophet Isaiah said, woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor of their rights and make women and children their prey, as Isaiah 10. And so, I want to see, we want to see these candidates stop ignoring, stop racializing poverty and acting like it's just black and brown people. When we know that white people, about 31% of white people are poor and low wealth, but that 31% of white people is 40 million more than the total number of black people that are in poverty. And then stop running from the issue of poverty. Stop listening to these consultants that tell you, People, poor people don't want to be called poor. We push poor people off the agenda for 50 years. And it's been 50 years too long. And we've got to change that. And Reverend, what do you tell activists who are overwhelmed by this poverty? They're overwhelmed by this injustice. What do you tell them to keep giving them hope to continue? A lot of times, many of these activists and folks struggling with poverty will give up hope. What's the message that you tell them that they cannot give up hope, that they must continue to fight um, these inequalities? Well, the ones that I'm meeting are telling me they can't give up. <laughs> As we move around the country, you know, we're not organized from the top down. See, we every state we went in, New Mexico, we were invited in. They invited us in because when people figure out that they have a right to be, to exist, and then they figure out they've been lied to. As Dr. King said, they, they kept getting a check, come back, mark insufficient fund. When people found, found out they've been lied to, and a lot of people have figured that out during COVID, we've been lied to. Every time, seven months ago, people were telling us we didn't have money to do this, we didn't have money to do this. Well, how did you find all this money all of a sudden? So people are now saying, wait a minute, you've been lying to us. And then when people find out that they've been told that their vote doesn't matter, and they find out, wait a minute, you mean to tell me just 2% of us could change this? 20% could change here? 1% could change here? It, it, it shifts the whole attitude of the battle. And which is why in Kentucky last year, poor and low wealth people came together. They had a mean governor who, who took back their health care and they came together. They, took, they changed three counties that were formerly Trump counties and put a new governor in place. Never endorsed him. They endorsed issues. He then took up the issues of the Poor People's Campaign. And the night that he was elected, he said, they gave a shout out to the campaign and said, I've learned during this election that some things are not about Democrat versus Republican and left versus right, but right versus wrong. And we believe that's going to start happening all over this country because people cannot continue to, to you know, they cannot continue to suffocate under the knee of police violence, under the knee of racism, and under the knee of poverty, there is something in the very inside of our souls that demands we have to fight to breathe. And that's what I think you're seeing in the streets. It's BLM, but I think if people just understand that it's Black Lives Matter, they're missing it. It's people who, in the midst of COVID, have experienced so much that when George Floyd said, I can't breathe, it was like shorthand for what many people are experiencing. Whether it's that poor worker that's been forced to go to work without the proper equipment, uh, whether it's that person that didn't have sick leave or unemployment, they feel like the weight of the systems are on top of them. And, and what you see in the street is the fight for this democracy to breathe. It is actually the hope of America. People don't understand the protest is the hope. The hope is in the morning because if folk just gave up on this country, you wouldn't see people in the street protesting. You would see something worse in the street. You know, that's why we have to separate the infiltrators doing the violence versus the real nonviolent protesters. But the protest is in itself a sign of hope. It means people do not believe 
that this democracy is beyond being changed and fixed and being made better. Reverend Barr, thank you for joining us here on New Mexico in Focus. We really appreciate it and we're honored to have you. Thank you so much. Take care now.